She's a Ugandan climate uh, and env environmental rights activist and the founder of Friday for Futures Uganda. May I say it is the largest youth movement in East Africa. She's based in Kampala and focuses on raising awareness and mobilizing students and young people. She fights for racial and gender justice, more diversity in the climate movement, and for climate justice and an end to fossil fuel. Hilda. Our planet is at a crossroads, facing unprecedented ecological challenges. Climate change threatens our very existence. Biodiversity loss looms large, and natural resources are depleting rapidly. Simultaneously, social disparities persist, denying millions of access to basic rights and opportunities. Ecosystems are strained, and vulnerable communities bear the brunt of inequality. My continent, Africa, with its rich tapestry of cultures, landscapes, and resources, has been both a cradle of human civilization and a reservoir of biodiversity. And yet, it has also faced significant challenges from environmental degradation to social inequalities. I am a victim of the climate crisis with a farmer's background from a region that has been severely affected. During my childhood, I observed the impacts of climate change on our plantation when rainfalls intensified, intensified and bent our crops to one direction. Rainfall submerged our streets and houses and made roads impassable for vehicles, and because of this, I missed going to school. During that period, my father and grandmother reassured me, stating the rainfall will stop and conditions will return to normal. However, merely three days later, we encountered similar intense rainstorms, and I missed school once again. Long story short, we lost our plantation, and I missed school for the rest of that year. I stand here today to represent millions of young people who are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. In eight out of 10 families without running water, it is the girls who walk for hours and hours each day in the dry season to find and collect water. According to UNICEF, girls spend 200 million hours a day collecting water. I'm going to repeat the number just so you know I wasn't mistaken. 200 million hours a day, that's around 25 million girls. And by 2030, it's estimated that water insecurity will skyrocket, displacing 700 million people, and most of them will be girls and women. As I speak, my country, Uganda, is yet to build the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline, the East African crude oil pipeline, a climate bomb. It has displaced over 100,000 people. 71% of global emissions from the world's 1%, more than 1 million deaths every year because of burning fossil fuels, humanity. The ones least responsible for climate change are the ones who undergo its most severe repercussions. Despite emitting less than 4% of carbon emissions, Africa shoulders the heaviest burden of environmental catastrophes. Within this context, my homeland, Uganda, ranks the 12th most vulnerable country to the impacts of climate change. The anguish we experience stems from a framework rooted in iniquity, a framework that draws resources from our planet to enrich affluent nations, disregarding the welfare of all individuals in the global south. Amidst this pressing concern 
lies a glimmer of hope, the power of action. We find inspiration in the strides being taken towards a more sustainable and just future. Each one of us holds the potential to become an agent of change, to lead by example and inspire others to follow suit. It is time to embrace renewable energy sources, minimizing our carbon footprint and mitigating the effects of climate change. Equity and inclusivity must become our guiding principles as they are integral to sustainable development. Action means breaking down barriers that have hindered progress for marginalized groups. It involves amplifying voices that have long been silenced and fostering a culture where diversity is celebrated and cherished. But action cannot be confined within national borders. The ecological and society transition is a collective endeavor. We must collaborate across boundaries, transcending political, cultural, and economic differences. Every effort, no matter how modest, contributes to the collective force of transformation. Let us hold governments corporations and institutions accountable for their actions. Let us demand transparency and advocate for policies that prioritize sustainability and social progress. Understanding the impact of our choices on the environment and society empowers us to make conscious decisions that promote sustainability. Each one of you needs to consider what your power, your resources, your influence can do to change the trajectory of global warming and man-made environmental pollution. On behalf of Africa, I stand to say, Africa is not a dumping site. Stop polluting us, stop greenwashing us. We can see through these lies. We Africans aspire to develop, but not at the expense of our lives. What Africa really needs is support to build itself, invest in our roots, agriculture, tourism, fishery. This is what true development looks like. Let's build a world where ecological sustainability and social equity are not mere aspirations, but the very fabric of our existence. Our legacy will not be measured solely by the speeches we give, but by the actions we take today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. This is what humanity looks like. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed your standing ovation. I think it's very, very, yes, thank you so much, Hilda. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next guest here to the stage, and that is Diederik Samson. Diederik Samson is a former member of the Dutch Parliament and former leader of the Labour Party here in the Netherlands. And since 2019, he's been the head of cab cabinet of the EU commissioner responsible for climate action, and he also used to be a Greenpeace activist. This I didn't know. Back in the days. Back in the days. <laughs> <laughs> Diedrich, we've just heard the, I don't even know how to describe your speech, but your remarkable speech of Hilda. You working from the EU, um, as a reaction to her speech, what are you doing actually to hopefully come to her, what she was saying, and also how does it, your work reflects uh, to, to the relation with Africa? Well, my first initial response to this speech was, wow. Um, so, but let me explain you what I see from uh, where I work from, the European headquarters. I'm actually torn. Um, I'm torn between despair and also ecstasy. So, so let me start with the despair. Mm. If, if we really look at what is happening now with climate change, um, 
there is all reason for despair. I mean, we've seen the events in Pakistan, Bert already mentioned it, but also the devastating floods in Libya and all the other events. But let me tell you that at the moment, scientists are looking at graphs or maps that they literally cannot believe. It's the map of the temperature of the Northern Atlantic Ocean. At the moment, it's three degrees above normal temperatures and the temperature gradient is almost vertical. So, I know uh, it might sound like Cassandra if you warn for a runaway climate change, but we are living in times of runaway climate change. So, we need to do something about it very quickly. And then, the other observation, which makes me very optimistic, is the almost mind-boggling speed of innovation and growth and cost curves of renewable technologies. Mm -hmm. Solar, wind, electrical cars, batteries, electrolyzers, all those technologies. Only a few years ago, only 10 years ago, which is in energy terms yesterday, mm -hmm. they were unaffordable. If you would like to put an offshore wind park somewhere, well, in, the, in front of our shores, it would you cost you 18 cents per kilowatt hour, which is five times the normal price of electricity. The subsidy pot would be empty before you even start thinking about such a project. And now it's cost competitive and more than that. Solar energy is running at cost of one cent per kilowatt hour, which is four times cheaper than fossil fuels. And the project you fight is actually already out of business before it's actually starting. Mm. And yet it's going ahead, by the way. So we need to do something about it. And those two big developments, runaway climate change and this spectacular new economy coming up, they collide in Africa, literally almost. I mean, climate change, if there's a God out there, it's a cynical one because it affects and it hurts Africa more than elsewhere in the world. But also the potential for the renewable energy projects that we, that we actually could develop are enormous, especially in that continent. So here's the challenge. We need to implement this transition as fast as we can in Africa. That requires money, that requires political will, it requires science, it requires technology, and it requires people. And here, there's the catch, because every transition has a, a Darwinistic nature. Every industri industrial revolution, and this transition is a real one, always tends to end up with more money and more power in the hands of less people. And that's exactly what you want to prevent. And that's the theme of this conference today, a just transition. The problem with a just transition is that it is inherently slower than a fast one. There's this old saying eh, that says, if you want to go quick, go alone. If you want to go far, go with many. Well, I can tell you, we want to go far, quickly. So we, we need to coincide those two things. How to do that? Who do we need? Young people. The youth of our world, of our continents. From my own experience in Europe, I can tell you without hesitation that it's the youth of Europe that has created, embodied, and provided momentum for the Green Deal. I've, I've had so many conversations in the last four or five years about the Green Deal with, with many people that all think they're very important, and some, sometimes they are. So politicians, ministers, and CEOs of big companies, Mercedes-Benz. Mm. And they all, at one point in that conversation, start talking about their own children, asking questions. Small ones about eating so much meat, bigger ones about flying to Bali on holiday, and existential ones. Hey, Dad. What are you doing to save my future? And I can tell you, if you were the CEO of Mercedes-Benz and you have a bad shareholders meeting, that's a bad day. Or you have a bad headline in the newspaper, that's a bad day. But if you cannot answer your own children asking you that simple, very existential question, that's much more than a bad day. Mm -hmm. So I'm convinced that the young people of, especially Europe, have changed, have created the Green Deal. And now I'm sitting next to the leader of a youth movement in Africa. The largest in the East largest Africa. youth movement in Africa. So 
what I would like to ask you, Hilda, is, is um, what's your plans? Are you indeed going to muster this power of the young generation and change Africa for the better? Are you coming to the climate conference in, in Dubai and, and tell the story to us, to all those people who think they're very important, and sometimes they are? Is that your ambition? Because if that is, I want to support that with everything I have. Okay. Thanks. That's a very huge question because as youth, right now we are torn in between responsibility and survival. We have to stand up for ourselves in order to survive and that responsibility has shifted from the elder generation to us. So we are in the middle of everything. So it's either we act to survive or we don't. But be rest assured that youth will do everything in their power to create change, to fight for future generations, to do all that we can to save our world, to save our planet, because it's our future. And the future is now, that's why we are starting now. We are standing up, we are occupying spaces, we are on the streets, we are protesting, we are social media, we are everywhere, because we need our voices to be heard and listened to. And we will continue doing that until we achieve justice. Yes, I will be going to COP. Uh, I don't have a choice. <laughs> and um, I will be sharing my story. I'll be sharing our work. And I'll also be sharing uh, voices from Uganda. Because at the moment, uh, my other colleagues in the movement are traversing Uganda's schools and communities looking for recommendations. Uh, to put forward to the COP delegates that will represent Uganda and also to get these recommendations in a report that we will present at COP to different uh, decision makers, media, organizations, and everyone who will be present there, but also to mobilize um, the global community to stand with us, to stand in solidarity, to support our actions, to support our activities, and to listen to the voices of the young people all over the globe because we are changing the narratives. We are demanding and pushing action because we need it, not as soon as possible, but we need it now. Yeah. Yes, Thank and you know since you have been uh, an activist yourself working with Greenpeace mm -hmm. and now you shifted to the political side. I want to ask you how you found this shift uh, because as an activist, I sometimes feel like uh, the action, or the, the climate action that we demand is not uh, being implemented at the level at which it should be because this is an emergency. So my question is, how is that shift for you? How does it feel? And what would be your advice to the young generation? Hmm. Um, I, I moved from Greenpeace into politics because I wanted to change things for more than an hour. Because at Greenpeace, we try to stop a toxic pipeline from spilling its toxic waste into the, the river. We blocked the pipeline. We were very proud of ourselves. And we got dragged away by the police, arrested, put into jail. Um, and the pipeline was reopened and went on. If you really want to change things for... I mean, don't get me wrong, it was very important to do that, because by doing that, it became a headline in the newspaper, read by politicians, who started to think about, well, maybe we should change this. I wanted to be part of that change, became a politician and tried to change things for more than an hour sometimes in vain, sometimes with a bit more success. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that 
politics, and especially international politics, cooperation is the only way to, to fight this planetary challenge that we have. I mean, the, the climate doesn't have borders, politicians do. But the international political arena that we have constructed with all its problems and its pitfalls and its very imperfect structure is the best we have to survive as humanity. So my advice to, would be to the young generation, feed that process. F keep feeding that process, this international process, we call it the UNFCCC with the climate conferences, but there's much more around it. Keep feeding it. And I know from experience that your first or second or third or even fourth encounter which the, with this international political process will be so disappointing, <laughs> incredibly disappointing, mm. try for a fifth time. Because at some point, you will start feeding into this process. I already see it happening. I'm, I'm sort of a veteran with, in, within the UNFCCC, having been at all, almost all the COPs. But you see the, the progress. You have to be a little patient to really see it. And again, it's fed by young people. It's fed by young people not giving up, bringing their stories to the negotiating table where we are talking about dry text, Article 6.2, etc. And here, all of a sudden, there's people talking about real things in real countries, in real, for real people. That is needed. So I can encourage you, keep feeding that. Don't get disappointed. Be curious or even anxious or actually even angry because you have all the right to be. Keep telling us the truth. Thank you. <laughs> maybe, uh, I don't know, Hilda, maybe you have a last question or maybe there's just another message that you would also like to tell Diedrich and Diedrich can maybe also tell all of his colleagues within the EU. Are there some last remarks that you would like to share? Well, um, as a, as a follow-up question, I want to ask, how do you manage to keep your activist values into the political uh, mm. circle? Good uh, question. Do yeah. you still hold those? Uh, does it change? Because I know there are some activists who really want to become politicians because they see the, uh, the change is very slow. So how do you manage to keep that? And uh, another one is, as activists, we tend to see very slow um, response to our uh, actions. Do you think this can change? Are politicians really listening? Yeah. Um, well, I sometimes doubt that, and I have doubted it many times in my past. Um, and moving from, from Greenpeace into the political arena uh, is quite a big leap indeed. And I still miss the water in my face and the adrenaline through my body. But you get real change back. So I'm, maybe I'm too romantic about politics, having been a politician for so many years, but it's the only center of change. It's that, this is where change needs to happen. Or you, want, you, you might desire a dictatorship and nobody, nobody does. Nobody really wants that. So you need democracy, you need po politics to change things for the better. And yes, it might seem that change is not happening, um, but it is. The problem that we have is what I said at the beginning, we are in a hurry. Uh, so don't settle for slow change. Um, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. So my advice uh, that I give myself almost every day is stay anxious, stay curious, stay optimistic. Keep your optimism um, because we need it for, for the next decade. That's approximately the amount of time that we do have to put this world on a fundamentally different track towards sustainability instead of destruction. Those 10 years are for you. So every day, if, if you can muster the optimism, if you can find the anxiety, keep trying, and in the end, we will be successful. I'm sure of that. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diedrich. Thank you, Diedrich. Hilda, thank you so much. Can I have a... You have some always for you. Please take the mic. Uh, well, I just have some last words. And to everyone present here today, I just want this one statement to stick away, to stick in your mind. If there's something that you will go away with from this Africa Day, it's this statement. Change will happen at the speed of empathy. Thank you. Thank you.